welcome sir for sparing your precious time you. for our students uh, i welcome all the students of uh, btech second year third year and fourth year and mtech students uh, the students those who have joined guest and all the guests and all the faculty members so it's a pleasure to have with us dr k c upadhyay insa senior scientist school of life sciences at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. The topic of today's webinar is landmark discoveries in molecular biology, and we have with us a renowned scientist, Dr. K. C. Upadhyay. Dear all, Dr. Upadhyay did his PhD in 1971 from Pennsylvania State University, USA, and he was a postdoc fellow in the same university. also in the department of bio uh, biological sciences in the university of delaware usa he worked as visiting scientist in several countries and dr upadhyay was vice chancellor at maharaja shivaji rao university of baroda he was a former director of mit institute of biotechnology mit university noida and formerly professor of molecular genetics and dean school of life sciences jnu new delhi he has undertaken several research projects funded by dst dbt ugc etc and has over 90 research publications in national and international journals he is the achiever of many many awards including INSA senior scientist award and there is a huge list of achievements and awards which belong to dr upadhyay and my words will not be enough to describe them all so we are really obliged and we are really fortunate to have you here sir i would request you to proceed with your presentation sir all right thank you and i did not know the background of students who my be addressing so what i have made i made a little general talk and that will be overview of molecular biology emphasizing the landmark discoveries this title which i have given is landmark discoveries in molecular biology and let's start from the beginning what is the essence essence of life what is the essence of life the essence of life we already know is the nucleic acids the dna and rna majority of the micro of living systems we have a genetic material is dna and some of them have rna also but chemically it constitutes the life constitutes five elements we know the carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen and phosphorus of course it doesn't mean that in test tube we have these five elements this make up life is much more than that that's what we will discuss too the era of molecular biology started from 1953 with the elucidation of double helical structure of dna by watson and crick and that and this is on the right side if you see there is a structure which they postulated and uh, this is basically what it is that you have the two chains so the the, the dna molecules consist of the sugar that's deoxyribose you have a phosphate and you have a basis guanine cytosine thymine and adenine of course so sugar phosphate makes the backbone you see this this is back backbone and the bases are inside which have a paired structure that their guanine pairs with cytosine and thymine with adenine these of course very introductory must be known all these things but the two basic features of this one is that these two chains are anti parallel to each other there is a polarity involved there and in fact one chain we have a 5 prime to 3 prime direction other is a 5 prime to 3 prime direction so we say that these two chains are anti parallel to each other all naturally occurring polynucleotide chains contain 5 prime phosphate and 3 prime hydroxyl that is a universal rule okay so what i said the two chains they are anti parallel to each other and of course one chain is 5 prime to 3 prime direction and 3 prime to 5 prime direction 5 prime phosphate 3 prime hydroxyl 
and then two chains these two chains are complementary this is called complete complementary involved as one this chain is complementary with this chain so basically what it means that if we know the nucleotide structure of one chain we can predict the nucleotide structure of two chains when watson proposed the structure they proposed also because these are genetic material and these has to be transmitted to daughter cells so they have to be replicated and they they propose this thing so this is what we call the first lesson in molecular biology this says entire structure of molecular biology we call a central dogma of molecular biology and this is of course was proposed by francis crick in 1962 and what it says this says a flow of genetic information because genetic material is dna how this dna whatever the encoded information in this genetic material is goes into the language of protein this is what the traits are there so basically this says the flow of genetic information from dna to rna to protein it was proposed of course that rna x is intermediate molecule we are going historically this was and so this was so rna x is so in case of this the process the dna to rna is of course you already know the transcription and then the language that is still is rna is ribonucleotides so the ribonucleotide language of ribonucleotides are translated in the language of amino acids as a protein and that of course is called process called translation which you must have studied these now in this in 1969 was discovered that there are certain viruses we call retroviruses that this process can be reversed and this is what we call reverse transcription in retroviruses that in this case what is happening in transcription dna x as a template for the synthesis of rna in this case rna x as a template for synthesis of dna now in this uh, this process of or the uh, flow of genetic information or transfer of genetic information from dna to protein this of course is nutshell gives you the entire molecular biology because how the dna which is present there genetic material it replicates we have a dna replication there are certain viruses which are rna viruses the rna is replicated so we have rna replication and then of course have translation process in this case there are at least six nobel prizes there in this one of course they we already discussed we have watson crick and wilkins got the nobel prize for elucidation of dna structure and then is a for dna synthesis or synthesis of nucleic acids two persons got the nobel prize for transcription of nobel prize reverse transcription nobel prize the translation that two nobel prize genetic code nobel prize and the nobel prize for structure of ribosomes this is what we have the six nobel prizes for this francis crick james watson or skill kilkins the molecular structure of dna of course the basic structure these two people elucidated the structure wilkins lab X-ray diffraction pattern was made. Of course, there was a uh, Rosalind Franklin who was the X-ray crystallographer who did this work. And unfortunately, what has happened? She died before the Nobel Prize could be announced. And beside, beside the knowledge of uh, Franklin, Morris Wilkins showed the structure of X-ray diffraction pattern to these people, and that's how they they came out with the molecular structure of DNA. the dna synthesis had rna dna synthesis several which are arthur conbert known prize i have not listed the years here because what happens there is always a gap with the discovery and then you have to wait for several years before whatever has been postulated whatever has been discovered it has to be proven that whatever has been said is a correct so it takes time before nobel prizes can be awarded in this case the arthur conbert this is of course then i said the reverse transcription in the two in the tumor viruses tumor viruses used to delbeco used to work on this but reverse transcription discovery of waltimo and kenan roger conver the son of arthur conver got the nobel prize on eukaryotic transcription molecular based on nucleic transcription sorry the end of course genetic code we already know we have a for the howard holly and one kurana in marshall in about three persons and then recently and uh, the nobel prize for structure of 
ribosomes, which are the factory for synthesis of protein. We have a Benki Ramakrishnan, Thomas Stites, and this is, of course, uh, he, he is from Yale, and uh, last year he died. And he, she is from Israel. And Venki Ramakrishnan, most of you know, of course, uh, from Indian origin. And he has a distinction that he has DSC honors for physics from Maharaja Sahaja Rao University. Now let's, let's go back a little bit in this. We talk about molecular biology, basic things. We always talk about what is the distinction between molecular biology and biochemistry. The, the molecular biology is basically the biochemistry of gene. Everything relates to gene is a molecular biology. And this is gene is a central entity, central entity in genetics, central entity in molecular biology, and also genetic engineering. When we talk about gene manipulation, everything. The central player in this case is all gene. So let us define. How do we define a gene? We can define a gene as a part of the nucleotide sequences. This definition includes at the present knowledge. So this is a part of the nucleotide sequences that is necessary for the synthesis of functional polypeptide or an RNA molecule. What we are saying that gene, the end product of gene could be a protein or end product of the gene could be an RNA molecule. So we are RNA coding genes, we are protein coding genes. So we have a so that's why we are saying that the polypeptide end product is polypeptide or end product is RNA. The two things which I have listed here and marked with the blue, necessary and the functional. Necessary, I'll come back to this. The functional is that gene has to lead to a functional product. That's why we call it a gene. If it leads to a non-functional product, there is a defective polypeptide, defective RNA polymol, uh, uh, RNA molecule, we don't call it a gene, we call it a pseudo gene. So gene have necessity is functionality associated with this. Now let's come to the necessary. What we are saying that a nucleotide sequence, whatever nucleotide sequence required, whatever necessary for the synthesis of functional polypeptide RNA molecule, and that includes the, the production of a particular transcript, and that is our code for polypeptide of RNA, it means the sequence, the coding sequences, decides the regulatory sequences, which decide whether gene is going to be transcriptionally active or transcriptionally non-active, or it is going to be transcribed, is going to be not transcribed. So those sequences are regulatory sequences. So gene includes two structural and functional domains. We call a regulatory domain or the coding reasons. Coding reasons, whatever it codes for polypeptide or amino acids or RNA, regulatory sequence, which decides whether a particular gene is going to be transcribed. We'll come back to that later. And each domain, each domain, I said there are two domains there. That is the regulatory domain and the coding domain. Each domain has multi-subdomain -sub structures. And both, of course, are structural. When we say structural means a structure of nucleotides, functionality associated with the function. And we've already, we already said there are two distinct Functional and structural domains. Transcribe, we call transcription unit. Regulatory, we call promoter unit. Regulatory unit, we normally we define the say promoter sequences. And these two sequences, transcription unit from promoter sequences, we can delink these because they're nucleotide sequences by using restriction in that. We can delink these and we can recombine. Take a gene, the regulatory sequence from one organism or prokaryotic organism and, and the coding sequences from eukaryotic systems and we can combine these and delink a chimeric gene can be constructed. And then of course we said that each domain has multimodular subdomain structure. And of course these domains depend whether a particular gene is a prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So regulated domain or promoter is in this when we said the two domains, the transcription unit and the promoter sequences. The promoter sequences are the most important part of the gene. It's something like analogy we can give in a train, for example, you have compartments, you have an engine, compartments like a coding reason, engine is like a promoter. The, the, if you have just compartments, the train which is not functional, it won't move. You have to have an engine. And this is what happened in terms of gene, that you have to have a promoter sequences which directs, which regulates, whether a particular sequence is going to be transcribed or going to be not transcribed. Okay, let's... Uh, one more thing, this is, uh, we said essence of life was nucleic acids. What is the essence of eukaryote? 
essence of eukaryote is that the genetic material is sequestered in the nucleus. That is the essence of a eukaryote. And we always genetics, we, we talk about gene, we talk about alleles, we talk about locus. Let's define it. The gene we are defining. Alleles, we always, in a first lesson in genetics, we talk about the alternative form of the genes are uh, alleles. And this is this is what how to define alleles. Now the single nucleotide modification, single nucleotide mutations are alleles. Locus, where the gene is resides in the chromosome, is the locus. We said already that non-functional gene-related sequences are not, we don't call them gene, we call them pseudogenes or processed pseudogene. Basically, these sequences, now of course we will come back to this discussion. There is a sequences, DNA sequences are available, and in any organism. There are a multitude of pseudogenes available is present in the system, multitude of process pseudogenes. What is the difference between process pseudogene and pseudogene? Any gene which becomes defective, either because of mutations or because of some other reasons, which becomes a non-functional during the evolutionary process, we call it a pseudogene because it's not functional at the present time. What is the process pseudogene? Process pseudogene is a eukaryotic system actually. Because eukaryotes, in eukaryotes, the a transcript, you have a primary transcript. The transcripts, we'll discuss that. The introns are removed, intronic sequence are spliced out. And then we have modification at the five prime end, at three prime end. Now, what's the process pseudogene? There are many sequences that the systems present. And where they appear as if they have been reverse transcribed from a gene, from a process, from a, from a transcript. So if it is reverse transcribe or transcript, what it means, the promoter sequence are missing. Three prime end sequence contains multiple air residues, which is a part of the process transcript, and the introns are not present. And this is this is these sequences are present there. So we call them pseudo, they are pseudogenes because they're non-functional sequences, but they appear as if they have been processed from a process transcript, and that's why we call the process pseudogenes. Functional sequences, of course, the eukary eukaryotic genes we'll discuss a little bit. Oops. Oh. Okay. The sorry for the interruption. The in, in the prokaryotes we have a genes we'll discuss a little bit. Sometimes they have overlapping reading frames, which we call overlapping genes. In eukaryotes, many of the genes have altered splicing and they lead to multiple transcripts. Now, let, let's classify genes a little bit. We can classify on the basis of evolutionary origin, whether they basically saying that whether gene is a eukaryotic gene or a prokaryotic gene. And the difference between, we'll come back to this, this is this difference that is split versus non-split genes. Prokaryotic genes are continuous genes and eukaryotic genes are split genes. The organization wise contain exonic sequences containing intronic sequences. And on the base of transcription machinery, of course, we already discussed that the end product of gene is RNA or a polypeptide. So, so whether RNA coding genes or protein coding genes. On the basis of number of copies of genes, that in the genes we have single copy genes, multiple copies of the genes present. We have a gene families present. We'll discuss these individually. Or on the case of regulatory controls, that certain regulatory controls means functionality of particular genes, and that's where the regulatory controls are involved. There, there are genes which gene product is required all the time, we call the constitutive, or required certain developmental time, certain or they are induced. We'll come back to them to hormonal or something. They are inducible genes, and then sizes. Of course, sizes varies. Okay, so. Eukaryote versus, we already defined what eukaryotes are, the evolutionary origin. There are regulatory differences there. That we have in a, in a eukaryotic system, in a single, regula single regulatory unit controls a single transcription unit. We call a monocystronic. In a prokaryotic systems, we have a single regulatory unit controlling multiple coding units, and that's what we call the polycystronic. There are structural differences, and that will come again. Split genes versus non-split genes. The continuous versus split genes. And this is, of course, the difference in transcript machinery. 
that multiple RNA polymerase versus so if you have a, if you have a prokaryotic contains a single RNA polymerase which is responsible for transcription of all kinds of genes the protein coding genes or RNA coding genes but in a eukaryotic system you have multiple RNA polymerase there is also a distinction in in the normal RNA polymerase a protein coding RNA called RNA polymerase two that in the eukaryotic systems, we know there is a compartmentalization, a nuclear compartment, a cytoplasmic compartment. So, a special feature of RNA polymerase 2, there is a protein, the RNA polymerase responsible for synthesis of proteins is RNA polymerase 2 and DNA binding activity. The none of the RNA polymerase of eukaryotic systems, RNA polymerase 2, RNA polymerase 1, 2, 3 have DNA binding activity, whereas the RNA polymerase of prokaryotic system has DNA binding activity. There is a one very nice thing which really regulates the, the transcription of by RNA polymerase 2 that what has been found that RNA polymerase 2, the carboxy terminal domain of RNA polymerase 2 for all eukaryotic systems contain the repeats of seven amino acids, tyrosine, serine, proline, threonine, serine, proline and serine, seven peptides keeps on repeating. In yeast, it had 26 repeats. In mammalian system, the 50 suit repeats. Experiments were done to check really what is the basic function of these repeats. What was found if you keep on deleting these in in vitro system, at least 18 repeats are necessary for the functionality of RNA polymerase 2 in yeast. So basically, what means the repeats have some significance. There is a functionality attached to this. Now, this let's let's come back to now prokaryotic. This is what I have listed here is the idealized prokaryotic polycystonic transcript. And if you have a transcript, what I said was here, this is the gene. If you take a prokaryotic gene, the, the, the frame of reference is from the transcription unit to promoter sequence is a transcription start site. So if you go to left side is the upstream sequences, right side is a downstream sequences. So downstream, we have expanded this a downstream sequence. And we have these, there are three coding units, control, and in this, we have intercystronic regions, and each one that's been translated, we have a stop codons, a stop codons, and a stop codons, stop codons are three stop codons, which is universal both eukaryotic and prokaryotic systems. And the sequence in this case is a leader sequence, it's called the sequence, which is before the translation start site, in between transcription start site to translation start site, and then, we have a trailer sequence, which is the downstream to the stop codon of the system. This system, of course, uh, this was 1962. This paper was published by Francis Jacob, Loeff, and Monard. It says genetic control enzymes. This they gave the concept of operon. Operon is that you have a single regulatory unit controlling multiple coding units. And this is what it says. This promoter sequence, let's define the promoter sequence of this. There, when, when we say that prokaryotic systems, a single RNA polymerase, the responsible for transcription, all kinds of genes, whether protein coding genes of RNA coding genes, and you have a single RNA polymerase, and that of course it has a DNA binding activity, recognized sequences here. It was conjectured that there must be similarity in the promoter sequences of all the genes of prokaryotic systems. And what was done? That if you analyze the upstream sequences of let's say 100 genes from this, there was no similarity in this. Except the two domains, we call them the domains. The nomenclature wise, when we say to downstream is a plus nomenclature, and we say to us left side or the upstream is a minus one. So the two conserved domains, minus 10 sequence, A minus 35, except these two, there's no other conservation. There's no other conserved domains. And these, of course, the minus 10, we call Tata box. And then minus 35, TTGSCA. And there is a, there's a uh, I have written here, the 5 to 9 or 16 to 19. What it means, actually, that in this nucleotides, these are the uh, limits that you can have if you, if you expand beyond 19 or go below 16, the gene won't, the promoter will not function. If you, in this, the distances are five to nine base pairs. So if you have less than five or more than nine, this, the promoter will not function. 
and there's a plus one of course start and that's what i said that you have a two conserved domains here minus 35 and minus 10 sequence data box and this of course the i'm not going to discuss this uh, distinction between conserved and consensus sequence if you can ask i can explain okay in a eukaryotic system there are three categories at least genes a single the, the, the RNA polymer is one, RNA polymer is two, RNA polymer is three, RNA polymer is three transcribes ribosomal RNA genes, RNA polymer is three transcribes all protein coding genes. And then we have RNA polymer is three, which transcribes transfer RNA and a small RNA. And then it has been discovered recently that we have uh, besides three RNA polymers, there are some other RNA polymers, for example, RNA polymer is four. They might be involved in synthesis of small RNAs. I, I missed uh, the thing. There's this, uh, okay. Uh, in the central dogma, uh, I missed two things there. One was there are exceptions, what has been said. One exception was, just let's go back a little. I'll, I'll come back to this. I should have explained that. Are, in this, there are two exceptions there that, that they are non coding RNAs and their epigenetic mechanism. Non-coding RNA, is, as we will come back to that, the entire field has evolved. There, in this case, what was happening in the translation in this information transfer, we have a transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA, and we have messenger RNA, which is involved in the translation of this. There are a series of, now we know the RNA is present, which are not translated, which are not involved in this, we call them non-coding RNA. And then they have a lot of function in this, there are a lot of regulatory functions, they are present in the system. And then epigenetic. Epigenetic basically, we have same gene sequences, the proteins or the are not same. And that is genetics imposed, superimposed on this. And that is epigenetic. So they are basically two exceptions to central dogma here. Okay. Uh, this is uh, all right. So this is now a structure of eukaryotic, eukaryotic gene. And this is the structure of class two, that is protein coding gene. And this is what we are talking about here, that we have a intron, the genes, the, the majority of the high eukaryotic genes are split genes, contain exonic sequences, contain intronic sequences. These, the split gene discovery was made in 1977 by Richard, uh, Richard Roberts and Philip Sharp. And of course, uh, they published their paper in Cell, up to 1977, we did not know that the uh, eukaryotic genes are split genes. And there is, there is a nice anecdote about this discovery. In this, uh, Sarwan University is a very well-known molecular biologist, uh, Pierre Shemon. And that in, in uh, middle, mid 70s, in 76 actually, there was one postdoc working in his lab is a, from Scotland. And he was getting all results consistent with the split gene. But Pierre Simon was not convinced and he fired that postdoc. And later on, the papers come, two papers from Richard Roberts' lab and the Philip Sharp showing that there's a, there's a presence of introns in these sequences. So if you go back, Pierre Simon's lab, everything is relates to back to the split gene. If you have, so sometimes we say that exceptions make the rule. When you are doing a research, then don't neglect whatever you get in exceptions. Okay, and let's look, look at this now structure. He said transcription is start unit. There's a we have a translation start site that is a TG. There is a uh, five prime UTR and eukaryotic language we call the le leader sequences. Here we call five prime UTR sequences, and similarly we call trailer sequence and prokaryotic genes. Here we call three prime UTR sequence. Untranslated region, five prime untranslated. So every gene begins with exon and ends with exon. And these, of course, the translation stops are same. There is a now this, uh, there's a only thing is in this, there's a poly A signals at the end of the three prime untranslated region. There is ATA signals, the poly A polymerase adds in the process transcript, multiple A residues are added at three prime end. Again, I said that. The, always when we write the nucleotides, we write sequence of five prime to three prime. Let's go in the upstream sequence, upstream sequences towards upstream from transcript start site. Then again, the two conserved domains. One is the call minus 80 sequence and minus 25 data box. 
And, up, and besides this, there's a lot of on upstream regulatory elements present there. And these, of course, are involved both in this also present in the prokaryotic systems. These are the elements which involve in the in the regulatory controls of the genes. And we'll come back to this that we have a this part because the constitutive, we have a regulatory inducible part. All right. This, of course, we have already discussed. I'm not going to. Genes show different sizes, of course, the, as in this is what we are talking about. We are not talking about the prokaryotic systems. We are talking about the eukaryotic systems. Eukaryotic systems, as the system, as the complexity of the system increases, the number of split genes also increases. In the yeast, for example, oops, the yeast, for example, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, 96% genes are uninterrupted. Virtually no genes contain more than four exons. Average size is less than 1.4 kV, very small genes. And only few genes are longer than 5 kV. As we progress further in fungi, except yeast, majority of genes are interrupted, but they are fairly short, less than 5 kV, but contain less than six exons. As we go further in evolutionary scale, the higher eukaryotes, only few genes are uninterrupted. So there are only few genes which are not split, less than 6% in mammals. But they saw, if you go to mammals, there are very few genes which are less than 2 kV. Many are more than 500 kV. Average gene size in humans is 27 kV. Okay? And of course, many genes are very large. Several of them is a thousand nucleotides and so on. So usually what we say here, usually longer genes are the result of very long introns, not the result of coding of longer products. In higher eukaryotes, the average gene is approximately five times the length of its nest RNA. So we can conclude that this overall length of a gene driven by its introns. Okay, this is just the statistics actually, it's nothing to do. The largest gene in known in any system is a human dystrophin gene, which is 2.4 million base pairs. It has 79 exons, seven different promoters. If you have seven different promoters, it means there are gene. This gene, the product of this gene is required in different, uh, mus different organs. For example, your muscle promoter, cortical, Purkinje, retinal, CNS, swan cell, in general. And what it does, this dystrophin in human, they are the muscle fibers where we stand. So they, 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 the muscle fibers they provide the strength of the muscle fibers. That is the dystrophin protein. And see, we are at least talking about 2.4 million base pairs. And then you have only 14,000 nucleotide long transcript. There's only 3,000 over 3,685 amino acids. And the protein is 427 chloride. Deficiency of this protein is causes Duchenne and, Baker, and Baker's muscular dystrophy. This is X linked gene, actually, required an X clone. So basically, the, the males or the boys. They suffer with this if it is a defect because there's a single X chromosome there. And Duchenne is a very drastic, very severe form of muscular dystrophy, and Baker is a milder form. But basically, what happens in Duchenne form that after five, seven, eight years of boys, if the if the defects, if the uh, uh, dystrophin gene is mutant, then they become uh, ambulatory. They can't. Another statistic, muscle protein titan. Titan is a protein which is involved in the muscle contraction. And that, that the, statistically, that the protein, largest protein known in any system, 27,000 amino acids. The gene has the largest number of exons, that is 178 exons, and largest single exon in human genome, 17,000 nucleotide. Okay, let's, let's come back to number of copies. We said already, single copy, most of the in the prokaryotic systems, most of the genes are single copy genes. Eukaryotic systems, the, the of course there are a sizable number of genes which are single copy or unique sequences, but majority of sequence are multiple copies present in multiple times in the genome. And if we, there's a one classification we call gene families or multi-gene families, what it means that each member of multi-gene family, each gene member encodes the same protein. 
Exon, then we analyze exon sequence are highly conserved. Divergence and five prime untranslated region or three prime untranslated region. Intronic sequences, the promoter sequence are diverse. And indicating, of course, that they are encoding the same protein, but they are different genes because their five prime UTR are different, the three prime UTRs are different, the intronic sequence are different, the promoter sequence are different. But what happens in the system when you analyze this? There is an overlapping functionality of gene members, but sometimes what happens? Why there is a distinct functionality of each member? Each sometimes they function in a particular tissue, sometimes they function under particular conditions. But if a particular gene is defective, the functionality can be taken over. So that we call overlapping functionality or distinct functionality. Then we have super family. What are super family? Super families. Let's let's come back to the next one. This is the Arabidopsis. I've taken an example, which I used to work with the Arabidopsis system and working with the Calmodulin gene. Calmodulin has seven different genes. One is located in chromosome 5. It has a the, the Arabidopsis has five chromosomes, haploid number. So it has a one is located in chromosome 5 to each in chromosome 1, 2, and 3. And this is this is the one. If you have a blast sequence and see there are seven of them, only thing conservation is the Exonic sequences, exon one and exon two, there's one and only one intron, and there's no conservation, they're all different. The the five prime UT are different, the promoter is different, three prime UT is different. So these are the of course the part of the uh, multi-gene family. What is super gene family? Super gene family is set of multi-gene families, all originated from a common ancestor. That is defined as the what we call the globin super family. Globin, you have alpha globin, you have beta globin. You have myoglobin, and then in the that, that in the animal system, then you have a leg hemoglobin in, in legumes in the plants. These all of them, they there's a certain similarity in these. The intronic sequences, the position of introns are conserved in this, except leg hemoglobin has a this in, exon is split into another intron, but these positions are conserved, and then we say that these possibly have been derived. From a single progenitor allele, so all originated from a common ancestor, but they diverse and they have different functions now. Different gene families: you have alpha globin family, a beta globin family, myoglobin family, leguminous family. All are families, but there is some certain common ancestor exists, and that's what we call super family. Okay, then regulatory controls we discussed a little bit earlier. We have a two kinds of: we have a constitutive. You have inducible. Constitutive, I already said, constitutive genes are those which product of these genes are required all the times under all the conditions. We call them housekeeping genes because there is always in the wear tear in the cells, like normal analogy in the house, that basic functions of all house are same. So that's the terminology comes housekeeping function. And these constitutive fraction wise. They are in the, the number wise, they are more. So kinetic complexity is low. Number is more, but they are fraction wise, they are more. Inducible genes, they, the genes which are activated, transcriptionally activated in response to internal signals. We have a developmental signals. We have a tissue specific signals, hormones. For example, these genes, they are not active all the time, inducible genes. They are active under certain conditions. Under conditions of development, you have a, a, a tissues, fetal tissue, development tissue, or tissue specific. We have a we have a tissues, you have a muscle tissue, you have a nerve tissue, you have a hair tissue, you have a nerve tissue. So these certain genes which are active in only in those tissues, or there are certain categories of genes active under hormones. In hormones, of course, in development, they have the correlation. There could be external signals. External, you apply hormones, light in plants, for example. You have abiotic stresses, extreme light intensity in plants causes the activation of certain genes. Low high temperature, that is a common feature. In, this, in the plants, you have flooding, drought, salinity, metal toxicity, biotic stresses in common to all. We have pathogen infection, viruses, bacteria, fungi, nematodes, insect feeding, all these. So there is a certain categories of genes which are active, activated in response to these signals. And these are inducible genes. And this is what I already showed that slide. 
only thing is to emphasize this what is happening this the when i said constitutive it means these genes are transcriptionally active all the time because these product is required in all in the systems and all the time then there are these are elements present here which involve in the transcriptional regulation in the you have a light responsive elements you have a heat responsive elements hormonal responsive elements which confer this whether this gene is a light inducible gene hormonal responsive gene of any other kind of genes so these because upstream regulatory elements confer on these genes now it means of course very simple uh, one can say that what it means the constitutive genes because they are expressed all the time the promoter must be very simple promoter and but that's a very oh, the the view is this the oversimplification of whole thing and what has happened here in this if you the experiment was done you take a promoter sequence in the plant system we have a 35s promoter which is comes from 35s polymovirus and if you take this promoter which is co considered the the constitutive promoter which is in transgenic system we normally use that promoter to use to express genes so if you take that what experiment was done in namchuas leg and, and rock color university that if you delete certain make deletions of these certain interstices of deletion that promoter which was a constitutive promoter no more remains a constitutive promoter it becomes a inducible promoter what it means actually that this this basically means that even the constitutive promoters are highly complex promoters activation of particular gene is affected by interaction of multiple multiple proteins to multiple sequence elements present here and the effect of some interaction is up regulation of gene interaction of some is a down regulation of genes so what we see in the system is the some effects of all interactions and this is what is happening besides this of course when the constitutive promoter is a complex promoter the inducible promoters are much more complex okay of course there are the transcription factors the general transcription factors which are also involved in the constitutive x in the transcription activation of constitutive promoter then you have a specialized transcription factors specialized we already said that G, the the promoters could be hormonal induced promoter or in, in, induced by heat shock or induced by by uh, light so these basically so these promoters these so they are trans specialized transcription factor basic function of this transcription factor is to bind to these elements here present if suppose the transcription factor which is present in this what you call transacting factor so transcription factor which is involved in the light inducible of gene these transcription factor recognize the light inducible elements here so you have a protein which recognizes dna so dna protein interaction here so you have so these transcription factors we have two domain one domain is a protein domain other domain which recognizes dna protein interaction and then what happens that once this recognizes once the dna protein binds here the transcription factor and then transcription factor the protein protein interaction interacts with the general transcription factor and in order to initiate the transcription from a from a inducible protein okay this is just so just very complex picture and uh, uh, what just give you this the complexity of the system the eukaryotic nucleus how many things are going at the same time and how the system functions the complexity recent example of various levels of regulation like your gene expression and cell biology is a nuclear rna double stranded rna double stranded and we have a histone methyl transferases heterochromatin proteins you have promoter associate rna you have polycom group proteins you have a rna induced silencing complexes you have rna initiation transcription gene silencing you have a small interfering rna you have a transcription factor everything working in concert here in order to have a transcription regulation transcription activation of these genes so only thing i am showing this slide taken from the paper of umpral from here that there is a high degree of complexity but one has to realize this besides this complexity in this everything goes systematically nothing nothing moves everything is like computer like precision same thing in terms of regulatory controls we say that when the genes are regulatory controls in that that each gene has a 
let's just go back a little bit. What we are saying here that these the sequences here, each gene that whenever the transcription regulatory controls are involved, that when we say that certain whatever the program is written in these sequences here, and that's what's directing whether that how long particular gene is going to be transcribed. <coughs> and we we have we are fond of saying that since the 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 information is written here. <coughs> that each gene, that how many times it will be transcribed in a life cycle of organism, is all enshrined here. And we always say that what is happening here, that genes, everything has a finite life, <coughs> and everything is ma marching towards its final death. Okay, let's let's come back to second discovery. Now we have talked about. The other very important discovery we call a landmark discovery was then was the discovery of restriction enzymes and restriction enzyme discovery. Of course, the every because science progresses in incremental steps. The very nice this was happened in in the sixties that the Werner Arvers lab and they were working with the viruses and the bacteria which infect the bacterial cells and basically. There was a, always a question in terms of this, that what is happening in any ecosystem, a lot of bacteria present, different kind of bacteria. The cells lysed, the, the DNA is taken from one bacterial cells to another bacterial cells. And what was considered that if you have A bacterial cells, a big bacterial cells, DNA is liberated. If the A cells takes the B DNA, the B DNA, B cells take the A DNA. And then eventually what will happen that if this is there, then eventually you have A species, you have B species, eventually there will be three species. There will not be any A species, there will not be any species. But what we know in the system that A remains A, the B remains B. So there is a what was considered earlier in the 60s, it was all the apprehensions, there must be something in a bacterial system which recognizes cell from non-cell. And that's how it led to the discovery of restriction enzymes in bacterial system. That you have a, the, the bacteriophage infecting the bacteria, some bacterial cells. Then, then what was happening? That you reinfect again, it infects that bacterial cell, but it will not affect other bacterial cells. So basically, that the discovery was that there is a certain restriction system exists that you and this is what came the restriction modification system in the bacteria. That you have a RMN genetically. So that's how it led to the discovery of restriction enzymes. That what it means actually that bacterial DNA, as I said, that A species and B species. If the DNA from B species comes to A, A recognizes this is a non-self DNA and it degrades there. And these are the presence of restriction enzymes. So restriction enzymes, if they don't they don't degrade their own DNA because that DNA is modified, they're methylated. So they recognize their own DNA, they, rec they can recognize their non Self DNA and non cell DNA can be degraded. And that's how they led to the discovery of restricted enzymes. And later on, the basically restricted enzymes are very various categories, but the enzymes which use the genetic engineering is, a, is, a, is a, a class two enzymes. And that enzymes, of course, they recognize the specific nucleotide sequences and then it cleaves DNA within or close to the recognition sites. So they have recognition site DNA and then is a cleavage. So you have a, that. So there are two things. One, the restriction enzyme recognizes the sequences and then makes the cleavage. Cleavage can be the staggered or cleavage can be a blunted. So one, so the, it, it depends on two basic discoveries. One is a restriction enzyme. Other one was that restriction enzyme, it cleaves the DNA. It creates a five prime phosphate, three prime hydroxylene, and there's another enzyme which is called DNA ligase. Which, which joins the broken end. Five prime phosphate, if you have three prime ter uh, termini side by side, it just makes the phosphorized bond. And there are three persons who share the Nobel Prize for this the Werner Arbor, Daniel Nathals, and, and Hamilton Smith. Entire field of these discovery led to what we call recombinant DNA technology, of course, that, that basically combining two different DNA molecules and 
This has led to the production of the genetically modified organisms, one kind of modification, the insertion of foreign genes of one species or another, transferring, transferring one or trans or altering the existing genes so that product is on. A variety of things. You have isolated the genes, you can modify them, and that is of course the and the genetic engineering. Another discovery which came, of course, the split gene came in 1977. This came in 19. 85, the, the, which revolutionized the study of molecular biology. Because, because everybody, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, is a technique to make many copies of specific DNA in, in vitro in testing. And this, of course, relies on the RNA poly, and DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase copies DNA. Since it requires the recycling every time because it keeps on multiplying, so you need the tech, the thermal stable tech polymerase. And then you have a so you have a if you have a, a, a DNA fragment which wants to more, uh, amplify it, it made multiple copies. You have to have a primers and both sides the five sign three prime and then two primers and then you have nucleotides and then tech polymerase and a, in a proper buffer system and in a, in a now they put machines that will work thermocycles. You put them and they recycle 35 cycles or 30 cycles and exponentially the DNA uh, amplifies. Of course, there are steps involved here, denaturation, primary annealing, chain extension, and which are our multiple copies of target region to be produced. PCR, of course, has a, uh, uh, now no lab, molecular biology lab, has, is able to do anything without PCR, multiple chain reaction. Either we have a, a DNA cloning, multiple, medical diagnostics, forensic analysis of DNA, DNA sequencing, besides multiple application of RT-PCR, real-time PCR. Of course, RT-PCR has become very famous now in, in Corona uh, COVID-19 because we have RT-PCR test. Basically, RNA, the COVID-19 is an RNA virus, so you make a, a reverse transcript, make the DNA, and then amplify it. Two persons got Nobel Prize, uh, Kerry Mullis and Michael Smith. Another discovery, which also revolutionized the whole thing, which is, it came in, in the end of uh, 1990s, 1998 actually, and that is the gene silencing what called, what called RNA interference. Of course, there is a long historical thing in this, but uh, what has happened actually, uh, that people uh, work and then eventually somebody else uh, harvest uh, or gets the results. This whole thing is started in the plant system. That in a simple experiment in petunia flowers is a gene called Charcot synthase, which is involved in anthocyanin pigmentation. So basic experiment was to be done that you increase a sing from single copy of Charcot synthase, make a multiple copy. So transfer another copy by genetic engineering to that plant petunia and in order to see basic aim was so that the the, the uh, anthocyanin pigmentation will be intensified. That's the basic idea was. But what has happened in the end result, expectation was the high potential for anthocyanin pigmentation, but end result was that many of the gene, many of the plants did not have any anthocyanin pigments. They're white flowers, or they're variegated flowers, or they have a low potential. So basically what has happened, that why in, why, uh, in introducing another copy of Charcot synthase gene into petunia led to the silencing of the gene. And this and plant system has been called a co-suppression. That, that multiple copies lead to the silencing of these genes. Then came then the vir virologist, the David uh, Welcome, uh, Welcome, who really did a lot of work in RNA, in, in RNA viruses and, and, and actually not only postulated, experimentally shown that the double standard RNA, which is responsible for RNA interference. Earlier, when you want to do the silencing, what used to be done, you used to do antisense RNA. And antisense, that is, you have a RNA transcript, if you make an antisense, it makes a double standard, and that gene gets silenced. But here, what was happening? This, of course, uh, that it was shown by in the viruses that you have a double standard RNA. 
And that, of course, conclusively was shown by C. elegans when two people, Fire and Mellow. Andrew Fire and Mellow in 1978 published very classic papers in C. elegans and showing that the gene silencing occurs post transcription to messenger RNA degradation. And of course, this is because that you have a double standard RNA, which causes the silencing of these. The basic process, of course, is here that you have a two kinds of now, of course, the entire field has developed. What we talked about uh, that non coding RNAs, and this is part of the non coding RNA machinery that you have another field has evolved we call the RNA biology that that in this case what happens in this this is basically what it is that you have a you that uh, called micro RNA micro RNA and you have a SI RNA micro RNA basically their genes present there and these genes they are processed and processed by uh, DROSA RNAs to the RNAs 3 and then of course translated and then loop kept us by uh, dicer another rna uh, called uh, rna enzyme and then it makes a risk that is rna induced silencing complex in cytoplasm so this is what is happening here that you have a poly that there, there's a pre micro rna present and then is processed by drosa that is rna3 different names given drosa is rna3 and also dicer is rnas and then that drosa very and then the, the processed microRNA, which is 22 to 25 nucleotide long doubles, that moves to this, and then dicer, and then this RNA, basically what happens, that this moves to, I, I, okay. Then it makes a, this in the, it, the dicer makes a loop, the, the, cuts by, uh, the loop is cut by dicer, and then, it pairs in the single strand RNA. So is a is a complementary by complementary sequences, RNA induced silencing complex. It, it forms and then becomes a dual standard and then it is cleaved. So basically that's the uh, that is the MI transcription and micro RNA transcription. The the two terminology used here, micro RNA and SI RNA. SI RNA is the uh, short interfering RNA. Short interfering RNA basically they are Micro RNA in the produce endogenously, SI RNA can be exogenous. Okay, then of course, the uh, only thing I, what I wanted to say here that uh, Melon fired the God Nobel Prize, but the person who really uh, is still there was a lot of discussion was going on. Those who did not win were gracious. David Welcome at the Cell Center Museum, one of those many cited as deserving recognition, but did not get the Nobel Prize. Either. And Phil Sharp actually, he says that need not give up hope. Maybe there will be another Nobel Prize for RNA work in the future. Anyway, another very important discovery which came in in uh, early part of this century in 2006. And what I'm going to discuss here is that this the showing that the differentiation. That's how it happens. You have a oocyte for the sperms and an egg fuse. You have a, and then becomes a marula. This is the human system. Okay, marula. This is a totipotent. Totipotent means it can induce to all kinds of tissues here. And then, then as the development goes, you have a, you have a classification, you have a blastocyte, and gives to human fetus. In this case, what happens? There's a, these cells are called pluripotent in this nearer mass cells. But once they differentiate, this cells they differentiate. Differentiation takes place, and then they lead to the cells, circulatory system, nervous system, immune system, or any other nerve system, hair cell, anything. So these cells, this is a in, in a human system or mammalian system, these are the differentiation is a unidirectional process. Once the the cells are differentiated, nervous system or or or, or heart system or any any cells. This system cannot be reversed back. The plants have a different property. The individual plant for any tissue, they can be made, they can made to generate the entire plant. In, in animal system and human system, it's not possible. This differentiation process cannot be reversed. So then, if you want to do this, this is this what the embryonic stem cells are. Okay, next, next, let's do. 
The stem cells, this we call the stem cells. The stem cells have a property to differentiate into. A stem cells are undifferentiated cells, unspecified cells. They are capable of dividing over over many long period of time. Under certain conditions, they can be induced to become cells, specified functions, muscle cells, neurons, or heart cells. And these are two kinds of stem cells. Biomedical, they are used in biomedical research. A embryonic stem cells and for early development, adult stem cells occurring in adult mice. Okay, uh, this. Uh, there was a lot of uh, work was going on, but people start working embryonic stem cells from fetus, and then a lot of uh, problem was there, a lot of ethical issues involved in this. So the basic important discovery was made in a classic paper in 2006 by uh, uh, Yamanaka's lab in, STEM, in the Institute of Frontier Science, Kyoto University. That is the lab where the Moli went to uh, Japan. He visited this lab, and what is what what he showed really the remarkable thing is that we what we were talking about we were talking about that once the cells are differentiated, they cannot be the differentiated program cannot be reversed. Then what they showed here that normal differentiated cells fibroblasts, for example, under certain conditions. You can reprogram the entire developmental cycle. And that's what we are saying here. We demonstrate, that's what they are saying. We demonstrate induction of pluripotent stem cells, bows, embryonic, for adult fibroblast cells. By introducing into cells four transcription factors, SOX3-4, SOX2, or CMIC cells, or KLF4. Four of these cells in the normal somatic cells can be becomes a pluripotent inducible cells. And it's called uh, IPS. This is this is what you're saying that you have embryonic stem cells, and these cells can act like a uh, pluripotent stem cells, which can directly generate it from the fibroblast. Of course, they, they this led to this. He initially showed in mouse embryonic cell, then later the mouse uh, uh, fibroblast culture cells, and then showed also in a in couple of years in humans that this is possible, and then. He got the Nobel Prize. Go down. This is a long work in a British scientist working with the uh, amphibia cells and showing that uh, uh, in uh, amphibia in frogs, for example, they can regenerate the mind. So they both. So he's a great developmental biologist. And Yamaka Naka is a great contribution that you have now. And these, of course, this led to the lot of speculation, not only speculation, a lot of work in the in the Uh, cells, for example, uh, there is a lot of uh, things that you can you can regenerate heart cells. You can regenerate a lot of the cells. The a, real experiment was done by Yamanaka's lab in in the medical institute. And I, the person was blind, and real cells were introduced there and led to the partial uh, restoration of eyesight. Then, of course, I have not uh, discussed. I, I admit that that happens in the 70s, but I brought it here because we will go continuously on this, that another discovery after the recombinant DNA was the DNA sequencing, the determining the nucleotide sequences, and that, of course, the, the three people share the Nobel Prize. Initially, it says the uh, Walter Gilbert was working with the chemical sequences. Here, we are working with the uh, enzymatic basis. And uh, Walter Gilbert, the chemical basis of uh, chemical uh, of the DNA sequencing now hardly any lab uses this. Is only everything which is based based is a singer. Singer got the second Nobel Prize of the protein sequencing to DNA sequencing. Okay, let's go back a little bit. The genome, of course, after sequencing. Uh, can I continue or I my time is up? Hello, hello. Uh, yes, sir. I am saying I am already one hour over. Do you want me to continue? Uh, sir, can you summarize? Uh, yes, continue, sir. Uh, eh? Continue. Uh, sir, you, con you continue. You can end up another five, five, seven minutes. Okay, sir. Okay, let us see. It might take a little okay, longer. Sir. Okay, okay. Sir. All right. Uh, this is uh, this is all part of the sequencing technology. That entire set of complement of organs was called genome and studies genomics. Of course, you know, human genome, we know already 3.2 billion base pairs. 
and it was a sequenced in uh, by two groups actually sequence came in the uh, beginning of this uh, century in 2000 and the draft sequence was announced simultaneously uh, by two president of united states and also the prime minister of england uh, okay now we know that it contains 3.2 billion base pairs and contains about 21500 genes and it has of course the all eukaryotic genes human gel a mitochondrial genome which is very small 16700 base pairs and 37 genes what is came out of this the 99.9% .9 nuclear sequence for individuals are identical and so when we are talking about identical sequences then I, there is a there is a great diversity in 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 uh, morphology of humans I, i'll have a slide of this show you but the differences because 99.9% .9 sequences are same the differences reside in 21% nuclear sequences and of course, we know this, that different individuals, that was, they are different because we have been knowing actually that there are differences in individuals because the, if persons, different persons suffer with the same disease, they do not respond identically to the same drug. And same thing, we know that HIV infection, some people get infected fast, manifestation disease fast, other uh, is not there. Okay, the sequencing technology go a little bit. That what has happened, what has changed really, that human HGP's human genome project, it took 13 years. And how many scientists were involved in this stage? And cost of sequencing, coverage, the and then number of countries involved. Then a Craig Venter also simultaneously sequenced this. It took four years and so many things. In 2008, Watson sequence was it took four months and is a cost was reduced to see 2.7 billion and 1.7 million dollars and then what has happened now the cost in present time is reduced so much that entire human genome can be sequenced for less than hundred thousand dollars and a lot of companies have come up to sequence the dna and with the, with the advent of new generation sequencing technology cost has been reduced drastically from 5,292 per million base 2001, now is, is 12.012 dollars per million base pairs in 2007. And of course, there's a company to sequence, there's a company called 23andMe, No Me also is one company. They, they, what they do, there's a, there's a craze in the United States that they want to know from where they came because America is called the uh, melting pot of civilization, the people came from everywhere. So they want to know what is our origin. So they what they 23andMe for $400, they sample the traits, disease risk, ancestry data. <coughs> Oops, sorry. And of course, there's a lot of other things have come up. And but whole thing is in this sequencing cost has been reduced, is lead to the precision medicine. Precision medicine, the entire genome of organism or individual can be sequenced, and then lot of genome wide association studies you have a uh, lot of diseases which have which, which have a multiple gene implications or then why this like for example diabetes heart disease and so on cancer that you uh, sequence the many of many individuals and then try to figure out which genes are involved in this okay this is what i was saying the diversity and then 99.1% that one percent, there's a, everyone looks different here. Of course, there there's a two studies made which sequence the people from 2,504 individuals, 26 pop, uh, populations across the five continental regions. And this is the how the variations exist. And these variations, as I said, is 0.1 percent of the nucleotide sequences. And these, of course, the uh, uh, we call it now single nucleotide polymer majority. Okay, this is the human genome. Nuclear genome, we already said, there are 3200 megabase, and only one third of this is gene or gene related sequences, remaining one is intergenic sequences. And out of this, there are 48 megabases genes. And of course, this, this is the intron sequences, gene fragments, pseudogenes, and so on. But majority of them sequences is a repeated sequences and then intergenic sequences. In this, we have a lot of RNAs there, which have 
micro RNAs. Micro RNA has now a lot of each system, eukaryotic systems, including humans, have multiple micro RNA genes. And these are these we know as a regulatory roles present. Okay, I, let's let's go fast. This is of course I'm not going to go. This is basic statistics. But now recently, what has happened? The Human Genome Project or others, which Human Genome Project sequence was used as a as a uh, mark for synthesis for comparing the other sequences. Now recently, what has been done? But from that, eight percent of the repeated sequences were left unsequenced, which were present in the interim in the in the centromeric regions, the telomeric sequences. Now we know this came recently, June one. The researchers they claim they have sequenced the entirety of the human genome, including missing parts, which is 8%, 8% of the genome. So this is what we are saying that uh, human cellular genomics, White House loan, because we already said discussed that when they announced the sequencing first draft genome, the historic draft and subsequent human DNA sequence have all missed about 8% of the genome. Now, by using a different kind of gene sequencing technology, they have sequenced all these. Okay, this is sequencing also in the plants. A lot of plant sequences now. Yeah. Okay, the last part which we'll discuss, and that is the last discovery which has also revolutionized the whole thing, which is the CRISPR CRISPR Cas9 CRISPR, and that is this, that, that, that that's taken from science. The paper came in 2012, and this is of course the in science this CRISPR Cas9 engineering a revolution in gene editing. Okay. There's a brief history, and brief history that the first described CRISPR first described in 1987, and basically in bacteria and also in archaea. And initially, what happens that these bacteriophages they infect the bacterial cells and leave behind the short, initially short repeat sequences. And initially, it was called short regulatory space repeats. And in 2012, it was it was renamed as cluster. Because there are multiple sequence presents, regulatory interspaced, because we have there's a uh, and the shawl palindromic sequences called CRISPR. And this, of course, is a part of the prokaryotic adaptive immune system. Because what happens, these systems present if the other bacteriophage comes and the bacterial cells, they can recognize these and then they can degrade, they can degrade the DNA. And of course, genome engineering by CRISPR in 2013. Yes. Yes, saying something. No, sir. Continue. Okay, the CRISPR. This is basically the structure CRISPR. The salt first. That uh, CRISPR Cas9 is enzyme. Now the battery of uh, cognate enzymes. Lot of uh, uh, the orthologs have been discovered. Cas1. These are all in the Cas1, Cas9, Cas12, Cas13. But in initially it was a Cas9, which was discovered by uh, the Dordna and Carpentier, who got the Nobel Prize. We'll discuss that. And basic idea was that you need a guide RNA, which goes to recognize complementary sequences. And the Cas9 is an enzyme, which is endonuclease, which cleaves the sequences. And what the uh, Dordna is that instead of two RNAs, they combine one single RNA. A single guide RNA, and that is the structure, that is the complementary sequences, and these complementary the CRISPR RNA so complementary sequences, they recognize these sequences and makes and cash nine makes the cleavage. And that's the basic logic of this: that basic recognition by guide RNA and then cleavage by uh, cash nine, the enzyme, which is the endonuclease. Okay, this is this is basically what this there's a special, there's a to 17, 20 nucleotide long sequences. There's a, uh, and it says the uh, photo spacer, proto spacer as just motifs that they are required for these sequences here. Okay. And then you have a uh, trans uh, CRISPR RNA and then makes the complementary sequences, make the cleavage. And then, of course, a lot of discoveries took place that you have a guide RNA, a NIC producing RNA, NIC producing cash line. They have been modified, and then uh, original DNA, the NIC, and the very prepared. But yeah, this is all applications of these. 
And so this is what it says: RNA guided genome engineering using the cluster regular interspersed short pattern feeds. Care system has yielded unprecedented ability to perform site-specific editing in a variety of genomes. Key modulator of system include choice of Cas9 ortholog. As I said, there are many of them: Cas9, Cas12, Cas13. In spatial sequence composition, the uh, single uh, guide RNA, secondary structure, epigenetic status of locus, Cas9 guide RNA complex specificity. Various things have been done. Now a lot of research has gone, and now the system. Is, is has wide applications in these, and not only wide applications. There are a lot of uh, in cancer, a lot of uh, clinical, a lot of uh, uh, trials are going on. Okay, this is the I have quoted from what it says. It's CRISPR. Two scientists to pioneer the revolutionary gene editing technology are winners of 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. The ability to cut where you want has revolutionized the life sciences. Okay, and basically these two scientists, I will come back to the genetic seizures were discovered by Rodna and Carpentier and colleagues. Okay, and of course, uh, besides these, because this, the, the other two very basic components, of course, the, the key contributed to the development of CRISPR was the Feng Zhang and the Broad Institute of MIT, Harvard, Cambridge, and George Chase and Harvard Medical Schools. But there is another chemist, which in fact, this person in the Vilnius University of Lithuania is almost simultaneously published the paper along with Jordan and Carpentier, but he missed the boat. I, I'll come back to that. <coughs> Reported 2011 that, okay. Less than a decade, such as we use caps and develop genome edited crops, insects, genetic models, experimental human therapies, Clinical trials are underway to use the technique and treat sickle cell anemia, hereditary blindness, cancer. Dodna Carpentier, that's okay. These, I will read. These are the two persons got Nobel Prize. Dodna and, and Emmanuel Carpenter show Nobel Prize. And, but the person who missed also. Sometimes, as I was talking about the, in the, in the plant, the David Balcom missed the prize. Here, in fact, he missed it. He himself, this fellow, since 2007, Focused on mechanical studies of CRISPR, CRISPR cache, the newly discovered bacteria and table system was among the first to demonstrate programmable DNA cleavage by CIS. He was the first one to say. According to him, his article was not even considered serious by the editor board of the Academic Journal and was not sent to the reviewer. When he sent, therefore, the time needed to be recognized the first was lost. Martin Schlenk reported that uh, Six Sing submitted his article describing DNA cleavage by Cache 9 to cell reports. On April 18, 12, much before the Dodman and Carpentier's paper. After his rejection without peer review, he is sent to PNS one month later. It took several months for review and publication. In the meantime, Dodman and Carpenter had published their finding in Science, where their finding was reviewed, accepted within two weeks. Time is important here. So, unfortunately, he lost. <coughs> so, this is what is but he got other prizes also. Two biochemists while carried with co-inventing the gene editing technology that was in 2013. Carpentier and Dodna were named 13 uh, winner of this year, no Kavli Prize, but he also shared this prize. So there was the expectation that Nobel Prize also will be shared by three persons, but his name was not there. Okay, he is in the chief scientist and head of the Department of Protein and DNA Interaction at uh, in the Lithuania. <coughs> All right, this is the basic reg. I'm not going to now emphasize. Future, of course, let me read this now. CRISPR, this is a paper by Nott and Dorna in Science in 2018. CRISPR cas based technology provided accessible, adaptable means to alter, regulate, and visualize genomes, enabling biological research and biotechnical applications in wide range of fields. CRISPR cas tools have vastly accelerated the pace of research from understanding the genetics of previously unstudied organisms to discovering genes that contribute directly to disease. The field of cash based biotechnology is developing at rapid pace with multiple cash 9 based clinical trials in progress beginning soon and the result of which will likely guide future use for somatic cell editing both ex vivo and, and patients. Okay, also in the crops is going on. That leading to recent rulings in US department that they are regulation. Okay. 
this is a, there was, has been a lot of controversy in this also. Because gene editing is now has become so simple and then whether the embryo editing gets and that was in, in 2015, England, they approved in the UK, they approved the, the embryo editing. What the question was, the editing is only that you, what you do after the genetic modification, human embryos to alter genes, just after fertilization. And researchers will stop the experiments after seven days and the embryos will be destroyed. What has happened in a Chinese scientist, he, he, Jian Kui became a widely known number 19 after he had claimed to have created the first human genetically added babies. Twin girls known by their pseudonyms, Lulu and Nana. And he said that he edited the genome of HIV positive men and HIV negative women using CRISPR Cas9, specifically targeting the gene CCR5 that codes for protein that HIV1 recognizes or recognized to enter the cell. He must try to create a specific mutation in the gene that few people naturally have and possibly confirm innate resistance to HIV. And of course, the announcement was initially praised in the press as a major scientific advancement, but following his scrutiny, how the experiments were executed. Following this, he received widespread condemnation and 29th number Chinese authorities suspended his research. Now, of course, he was jailed for three years. Okay, and then scientists, of course, the David Baltimore here, he, he, he seeks the moratorium address to human genome that could have inherited. And then he called a meeting in Washington to discuss this. Okay, I, I, I think I, I stop it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for summarizing the vast landmark discoveries in the field of molecular biology so nicely. And I hope all the participants must have uh, recalled all the important concepts related to genes and the scientists resp uh, responsible for these discoveries. Now I would uh, like uh, to call Professor P.K. Paul from our department for a vote of thanks. Paul, sir. So it was a... Uh... I would say a comprehensive lecture on molecular biology, and I would like to specifically thank Professor Padhyay. Uh, I would also call him one of my mentors who have shaped uh, quite a few years which I have interacted with him for his quite innovative way of delivering the entire concept of molecular biology since its inception uh, as the human, uh, the mankind sees it. And I would really say that many of the landmarks would have not been available in a normal textbook. This is something uh, like what the even the the June latest uh, the June one uh, information of the complete sequencing of the human genome possibly at least was not known to me that the uh, missing links have been solved. So uh, possibly I would say this is I would call him as a textbook of molecular biology because I know him. Uh, from very close uh, waters of my interaction with him. And I'm sure this lecture must have served as a uh, important impetus for many of us, including the students, to consider molecular biology as a future line of study. Or maybe new entrepreneurs in involving molecular biology as a field. Because with COVID-19, we say molecular, we see that molecular biology has really become an important tool. And Testing for COVID biology is also an aspect of uh, contribution of molecular biology, as Professor Pathe rightly pointed out with the RT-PCR technique. And I would thank you, very, sir, very much for this en enlightenment lecture, in which not only the basics, but the continuity of the molecular biology from its inception till today is very important, particularly for the students. I thank you again for providing, for giving, taking much of your valuable time and providing these inputs. And maybe in near future, or we'll hope that we'll interact with you again. Uh, with these few words, I thank you again. My, I thank my colleagues and students. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you. Uh, thank you again. Okay, thank you. Nainsa, can we close now? Uh, students, you have to fill the. Uh, form that has been given.
here in the chat window. And if you have any queries, then you can ask them.